about ready to start to ride it, and Steve looks at him and said, Officer Emery, he knew him by name, <laughs> Officer Emery, is there any way I could get out of this ticket? And Ralph looked at him and said, the only way you would get out of this ticket is if the lawgiver Moses was sitting right next to you. And McQueen starts laughing, and he says, he is. And Ralph got down on the window and looked over. Charlton Heston was sitting in the seat next to him. That is a true story, man. I did not make that up. I said, I just got to tell that story. No, so, so, so he just walked back to his car and just shook his head, man. He said, okay, well, what, what are the odds, man? <clears throat> but I said, you know, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. And that, I had so much fun with that story that I, I had to tell it again today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to turn your attention to the screen for our morning announcements and welcome. Good morning and welcome to New Hope Community Church. Happy Father's Day. If you're a guest with us this morning, you honor us with your presence. If you'd like to fill out a connect card at the pew in front of you, then that'll give us the information so that we can send you information about what goes on here at New Hope, not just on Sunday mornings, but for the rest of the week too. It's pretty busy here on campus. It's our vision here at New Hope to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ to everyone that we meet. Here are just some of the activities going on here on campus and off campus that we hope achieve that purpose. If you're a parent of a teenager, a pre-teenager, an almost out of teen teenager, we have an awesome thing for you. On June 23rd, we have the Next Level Parent Conference. It's a one-day training conference with special guest speakers um, where you get a chance to take your parenting to the next level. You'll leave this conference uh, equipped, refreshed, and excited to connect with your teenager on a whole nother level. Because let's be honest, parenting teens is hard. So I can't wait to see you there. June 23rd, registration opens at 8.30 that morning, and we go all day. Lunch is included for a low price of $20 per family. If you go to newhopechurch.net, uh, right on the very top of the webpage, you can register there. Can't wait to see you. Calling all young families. Jam Kids Water Night is on June 27th. There'll be a giant water slide, a big slip and slide, barbecue, other water games. It's great fun for the whole family. Come along and join us. So that's June 27th, starts at 5.30. We can't wait to see you there. Hey everybody, if your child is interested in attending our Vacation Bible School, go ahead and head on over to our New Hope webpage and click the VBS button at the top. The dates are July 9th through July 12th. All the rest of the information is on the website. Don't wait to sign up. It's summertime. That means that it's firework time. In the student ministries department, we're gonna be selling fireworks this year out on the front lawn. From June 30th to July 4th, we'll be selling fireworks to help our high schoolers go to camp. We would love for you to come and get some fireworks from us. Say hi, maybe hang out a little bit. Um, but we'll be out there. We'd love to be your place to purchase fireworks this year. If you're interested in getting involved at New Hope, there are many serving opportunities here. Go to the New Hope webpage under Ministries. Go to the bottom and there's a Serving Opportunities. There will be plenty listed out there. It's a great way to get to know people and serve your church. Thanks for coming. And remember, this Father's Day is a great opportunity to give thanks to our Heavenly Father for giving us the greatest gift the world has ever seen, His Son, Jesus Christ. How many of you were at Carnival 55 this past week? Raise your hand, you were at Carnival 55. All right, look at that. We had over 220 people at Carnival 55 this past week. It was awesome. So we have a one minute review. For those of you who didn't go, we want you to know what you missed out on. What?
nights are long Where they walk And I walk They twist And I twist They shimmy <laughs> And I shimmy They fly And I fly Well, they're out there having fun In that one California sun <laughs> Thanks for everybody for coming out to Carnival 55. We had some world record holders in the baseball toss. Great fun. Charlotte and Mark Scott, they're the long distance toss winners. Thanks for coming out. It's great fun. Hi, it's uh, Pastor Steve, your Carnival 55 ringmaster here. I just want to say thank you to everybody that showed up Tuesday for our Carnival 55, the first ever Carnival 55. Thanks for coming. We had a great time, a lot of good food. And uh, we hope maybe that will be enough to encourage you to be here starting next month, July 10th, at our senior luncheon. So we hope to see you. Thanks again for being a part of it. And we did have a lot of fun, so it was absolutely terrific. All right, it is Father's Day. If you are here and you are a dad, stand up for me real quick. You're here and you're a dad. Stand up, all right? Woo, look at all these men. All right, outstanding, terrific. Thank you guys for being here. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, can you believe the office staff put the men's gifts in pale blue and pink, all right, for us to hand out. <clears throat> but manly men are not bothered by that, all right? So what I'm going to do is just send this down, hand it to the row behind you, send it down. You, I, is, is this clear? All right? And every man, all right? And you don't look around to see if anybody's going to tell you, you know you're a man, all right? You're a guy, all right? You don't have to be a dad today. You get a gift, all right? If you're here, you're a guy take a gift. I'll show you what the gift is in just a minute. You get the first one, all right, and then hand it on down. There we go. It's a little heavier than it looks, okay? Even though it's pink, it's a little heavy. All right, here we go. I have in my pocket what's inside that box, okay? You get a money clip. There's no money in the clip, but you get the clip, okay? Uh, on one side, it has a scripture verse that says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. On one side, it's got uh, a file. I'm not sure why they put that in a man's knife. Uh, there's, don't, don't take this to the airport, okay? Uh, and then it's even got a little pair of scissors there. Somebody at 8 o'clock service said that was for your ears. All right, I have no idea. I have, I have no idea what that's all about, but that's what was said to me. Sign-up sheets that are coming around. Uh, there are three things on here. Uh, the top one is if you would like to attend the uh, Next Level Parent Conference this coming Saturday, you can sign up for that. Uh, also on the clipboard is, be sure you read what's at the top. They might be in different order from one board to the next. Uh, Love and Respect Bible Study. This is going to be starting Tuesday night, June the 26th. Not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. This is a Bible study on marriage. This is not just a Bible study if your marriage is in trouble, all right? If your marriage is in trouble, great, come. It will hopefully get you out of trouble. If you've got, you know, an average marriage, this will help make your marriage above average. If you've got a good marriage, it'll make it a better marriage, all right? Uh, the book they're using for the foundation of the study, Love and Respect, I think is the best book written on marriage uh, ever, all right? And so it's a great resource. I would encourage you, if you're available on Tuesday nights, sign up. If you've already signed up, you don't need to sign again. And then Vacation Bible School Volunteers. Again, this went around last week. If uh, you already signed up, you do not need to sign up there again. All right, so those are the sign-up sheets that are coming around. There will not be church at 5 o'clock tonight. We took off uh, our evening service for Mother's Day. We thought it was only fair we take it off for Father's Day as well. You might be barbecuing for your, your dad this evening, all right? Uh, junior high kids, they all came back from Hume. Yeah, every one of them. Every one of them came back. Uh, one of them came back a little early. They had a little uh, food uh, poisoning, I think, that went around. And so uh, quite a few kids got sick the early part of the week, but it, it, it got better as the week went on. Uh, the most exciting thing is, is two of the junior high kids who went with our group invited Jesus Christ in their life this week. So that is exciting. That's, that's one of the reasons we do. 
On top of the Carnal 55, we also had the newbies dessert at our house this week. 72 people crammed into our backyard. 64 newbies and eight staff and servers, all right? We had a, we had a, let, let me tell you, a little miracle took place. Number one, I had no idea where the sun would be at 645. And my neighbors have two trees in the perfect place. Sorry, not y'all, you're on the wrong side of me. My other neighbors, the sinners, <laughs> that is their last name. I am not making that up. That is their last name, all right? They have trees in a perfect place because our backyard was completely in shade once 645 hit. And at about five minutes to seven, the breeze kicked up. It was perfect, all right? It was a great evening. Uh, and we had the ice cream and milkshakes, okay? Because it was still a little bit warm for ice cream, all right? So they became milkshakes sometimes very, very quickly. But, uh, but we had a good time. We had a really, really, oh, didn't we have a good time? How, how many of here you went to that? All right, uh, uh, look, look at there. All right, most of them are in this service. All right, good job. Thanks, guys. Uh, I think I've covered all of oh, Enroll your kids in VBS. Don't wait to the last minute. It's very helpful to the staff if you get that done early, if you would, please. Let me bring you some updates on, on some prayer requests. All right, uh, Donna Walters has not been able to be with us the last two weeks. Uh, she's in severe pain with her uh, sciatic uh, nerve back problems. She is going to an outpatient procedure later this week. Hopefully that will give her some relief. Uh, Randy Berger played for a memorial service last week for us here at the church. Randy used to be one of our uh, worship leaders here. And uh, I found out his wife, Cheryl Berger, has been diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer. And so she started treatment. So I told him we would be remembering to pray for her and gave me permission to put her name in our bulletin. Um, I hope most of you read the email I sent out this week about George Mannon. Um, for those of you who don't know George, because he's not been able to be around church a lot this past six months because of his health issues, uh, George was originally part of Ashbrook Church, the church that merged here at this location with New Hope uh, 26 years ago. He was part of the church board that helped work that merger out. Uh, he was part of a team in those days of four men, my dad, Frank Hicks, Gene Fry, and George Mannon, who were the maintenance guys around here. They would come two days a week and just whatever needed to be done, uh, they would fix, repair, and what they couldn't figure out, they would call Ed Murbach, and he would tell them how to fix it. He was a, a general contractor. So um, they were going to call hospice to come out that day, and uh, George and God decided hospice wasn't necessary. He went on to heaven without them, and so... Uh, that service is going to be Thursday right here at 11 o'clock. Joe Collins, his service is on Saturday at 11 o'clock. Also one of our church family. Yesterday was Ralph Emery, all right, part of our church family whose service was here yesterday. Um, over these last three weeks, you guys have heard me list many, many names. We've, we've, we've done, um, but by the end of next week, we will have done 11 funerals in the last three weeks. And we cannot do that without you all. Um, you all who have volunteered have just done great, great work. And, and Shelly has got the Thursday and the Saturday services. All the volunteers are set and ready to go and feeling really good. And I got a call uh, late Friday that I got confirmation of today. So we are going to have a service here on Friday as well as Thursday and Saturday. So for those of you who are volunteers, thank you. If you can't help do all that, we understand. If you haven't been able to help in the last few, but you would be available for that one on Friday, it's going to be at 1 o'clock. We don't have to provide food, but we do have to provide reception area. It will be set up, serve, and clean up, but we don't have to do food for that one. I tried to say no. They wanted it on Saturday. I said, we couldn't. We already have a service, have a wedding. Uh, gave them some other options. They said, any window at all on Friday. We have two gravesides Friday morning, an event at our house Friday evening. And so I said, about the only window was 1 o'clock. I figured they would say no. And here's one of the reasons I couldn't say completely no to them is, one, I did a service for this family, for their brother, two years ago. He died in his late 20s. This is a sister-in-law. She took a nap last week, at, 40, at the beginning of the week, 
46 years old, laid down to take a nap. They went in to wake her up three hours later, thought she had slept long enough. She was not sleeping. She had passed away. So um, there's family here that are going to be leaving the first of the week, and so we're going to be doing that. So um, I, I apologize to you, and yet here's what the Scripture tells us. And I've had to be reminded of this the last 48 hours. The scripture says we do not grow weary in well-doing. This is well-doing, folks. Um, this makes a difference in the lives of families at a very, very critical time. Just, just, and I, I didn't set this up, and I might be in danger of doing it. How many of you, your first introduction to New Hope was at a memorial service? Do you raise your hand? All right, just look around. There's about 15 hands up. Okay, it's, um, it's a time in which families need to hear yes, not no. I said that last week, but um, the following week, I almost hate to say this, there's nothing. Bob, I said to our pastoral staff, we meet on Tuesday mornings, I said to them early Tuesday morning, I said, guys, it's been a hectic couple of weeks, but I said, to my knowledge, there's nobody on the front porch waiting to go to heaven yet. Nobody's in the hospital. Nobody's under hospice. An hour and 15 minutes later, we got the call that George Manning had gone to heaven. So sometimes they're on the front porch and we don't know. All right? Uh, uh, that is, her name is Nisha Mailing. She is the 46-year-old woman who didn't wake up from a nap. Okay, and so that will be at 1 o'clock here on Friday. So pray for our volunteers. We've had some new volunteers step in and help out. We're so grateful for that. And I know it's just a little bit hectic this week, but uh, thank you so much for your prayers. Do remember the Gallardi family. Uh, I mentioned this in some, but I don't think all the services. Her sister passed away about uh, two weeks ago uh, out of the area, so please be remembering to pray for them. Uh, I think those are the updates that I needed to share with you. Um, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and our offerings today. Gentlemen, if you'd come. Oh, while we're talking of offering, how many of you read the bulletin and check the offering week to week? All right, about 12 of you. All right, good. We, we do it for you all. Uh, let me just make a brief comment. Did you notice anything unusual today? Yeah, it was, it, last Sunday was an exceptionally large offering. Let's all just say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do sometimes like to give disclaimers because um, when I saw it, I said, "What happened?" <laughs> um, and and uh, there was one rather large contribution. All right, um, and I don't know if they hit the lottery or what, but. Uh, anyway, there was, there was one large. The, the rest of the offering was a normal week, all right, with one exceptional. So that is what gave the boost. We're, we're very grateful for that, and we just simply say thank you. I will tell you there's one I specifically know about also that went to our building fund. Uh, we received a $7,000 check from Texas for our building fund. Yeah. I'm going to have to start advertising in Texas now, all right? But uh, no, uh, uh, I hope they send another one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, it was uh, an, an exceptional week, and we're very grateful, particularly as we head into the summer months. So would you join with us as we pray? Our Father in heaven, we love you. We are grateful for your sufficiency and for the way in which you supply our needs. Thank you that you have, in your sovereignty, recognized that we cannot live the Christian life out of effort or even just obedience. But, Father, it requires your Son, the Lord Jesus, in us to do through us what he did for all of us when he lived his 33 years of perfection on earth. And that 33 years of perfection is what qualified him to die the death that he died. But Father, he rose again so that he could do again in us what he did for us 2,000 years ago. Father, the Christian life is not a life of imitation. This is a life of participation. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I trust that in growing measure we'll learn what that means so that the truth of Scripture becomes real in us that we don't get weary in well-doing. 
Thank you for the comfort you've provided to families in need recently, and thank you for how you continue to use this church family in the days ahead. We pray for so many in our church, Lord, who have experienced um, the absence of someone that they love so much. But Father, thank you for the expression of those family members who, though there is a sense of immediate loss, there is great joy of knowing that they're in heaven. Thank you for the difference that makes for us. For the privilege of giving today, we say thank you. And Father, we pray for your leadership and the way in which we use all of the resources that you supply here, not only for the advancement of your kingdom work here at New Hope, but the way in which, Father, that is shared literally around the world. Thank you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. That is a good song, and it's great for the sermon series that we're in. What are we talking about these days? Yeah, what do you have to do to get there? Die. Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, and, and, you know, and the purpose for doing this series um, was so, one, it would take away a lot of a fear that we have. It would take away some of the uncertainty that we might experience when it becomes our moment. And I think we've done too good a job the last few months preaching on heaven because it seems like people are jumping in a hurry to get there. So um, maybe we'll take a break for a little while. <laughs> Just kidding. But there, there is this, it's, you have no idea what it's like when you sit with, um, with a Darlene or a Nancy Collins over these last two weeks. And I've sat with them. And yes, yes, there is the loss of a of a spouse that they've walked this life with for 50 to 60 years and in the same breath they say well it was so sweet it was so good I'm so blessed that's what that's what knowing about where we're going I think does for us and it's about knowing the one who gets us there that it does for us and so we're involved in a series if you're new today you're kind of coming in in the middle of it it's called what's up with heaven and uh, I actually ask our church congregation uh, at the beginning of the series what are the questions they have about heaven, what are the things they're wanting to know. I had one in the last service. Just as I got up, I started to preach. He said, well, hold on, Tim, I got a question. Do not any of you try that in this service. It took me 10 minutes to answer that question. But it was an important question, and it's one I'll probably deal before we finish this series because it's, it's, it's a biggie. It's, well, it has to do with suicide in heaven. And this was a big one for him. His son committed suicide, and he, we, we took some time answering it right then. And we'll, we'll do one that, that involves a little more deeply that subject. But we all have questions about, pertaining to, how to. And if you recall, last week, what were we talking about? Yeah, near-death experiences, NDEs. That was one of the prominent questions. What about all these books that have been written? Are, 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 is there validity to these near-death experiences? And last week we introduced that. I, we don't have the time to go back and, and, and review what we did last week, so it is on the website. You can go back and check it out. We're going to kind of pick up where we left off, and we're going to be looking at, 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 at seven things that ought to be at the front of our mind as we evaluate near-death experiences, all right? I'm not telling you that, that, that they're not real. I'm not telling you they're not true. But as we look and listen at these things, uh, I think there are seven points of evaluation that are very, very important. Um, when I was in Bible college and I was going through a class called homiletics, and homiletics is the, uh, uh, it's the study of the craft of preparing and preaching a sermon. How do you study, prepare, organize, and, 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 and write a sermon, and then how do you deliver a sermon? And one of the questions asked the very first week is, what is the difference between preaching and teaching? Anybody want to guess an answer? Volume! <laughs> Preachers tend to yell, all right. Teachers tend to talk very quietly, you know, monotone. That, that really is not the whole truth. It's partly true, uh, but it really isn't the whole truth. Um, if you have to kind of differentiate, uh, every, every message ought to be instructional, okay? Every sermon should be instructional. But part of the primary purpose of preaching sermons is to exhort, to encourage, to lift up, to challenge. The primary focus of teaching 
is to impart knowledge. And imparting knowledge is not always encouraging. Imparting knowledge is not always exhorting. Imparting knowledge is not always challenging. So preaching is kind of the blend of those two things. And I'm telling you, you say, Tim, why are you doing this today? Why are you explaining this? Because I feel like that what I'm going to do today is more teaching than preaching. Near-death experiences cannot be found in the Bible. But it's one of the questions that many, many of you had. So that's why we're dealing with it. And the things that I'm going to talk about today are probably a bit more instructional I hope you'll find some encouragement out of it. I hope maybe you'll be challenged by something in it. But it, And I'm going to move rather quickly as well, okay? So put your tinny runners on your ears and let's take off. How, how many of you remember when we used to park in parking lots that they gave you a ticket and they told you, while you're shopping in the store, please get your ticket, what? Good job, you all remember that. You guys probably have no idea about validating parking tickets, do you? Okay, because now you either get it for free or you just pay for it, all right? There's not much validation out there anymore. But, But the purpose was, hey, we don't mind you parking in our parking lot if you are shopping in our store. So you had to get your your ticket stamped to prove that we shopped here and we didn't just park here. Well, that same principle is true as we look at this subject of near-death experiences. NDEs, near-death experiences, without biblical validation. No one can deny that you parked here, but there's no evidence that you shopped here. Okay? That's a parking ticket. A parking ticket validation, without validation, no one can deny that you park there, but no evidence that you shop there. An NDE, without biblical validation, no one can deny your experience, but there is no evidence that you were there. You with me on this? You see, truth, God's truth must validate our experience. We are living in a time in history in which people are using their experience in an attempt to validate truth, as if their experience is more important than truth. But you see, experiences are different and changing. The truth is consistent. Let me back up to yesterday's memorial service for Ralph Emery. His wife, Darlene, called me two days before the service and said, Tim, it's taken me a while to put into words my last minutes with Ralph. She said, I pulled up a chair next to his bed. They had a hospice bed in the front room. And she said, I pulled up a chair by the side of his bed. I knew it was getting close. I reached over and I held his hand and I put my other hand on his thigh and I rested my head on his side. And I just sat there. And I got to tell you, while I sat there, I became so peaceful. I knew he was leaving soon. And as I sat there enjoying this peace, all of a sudden there was this extremely warm feeling it was the warmest feeling I've ever had in my life it was almost like it was almost like Ralph passed right through me on his way out it was so beautiful and then a former neighbor who was like an adopted kid of ours came in I didn't even know he was in the room and he put a hand on Ralph's head and Then he put a hand on my shoulder and said, Darlene, he's gone. He's gone. And he was. Now, was that a near-death experience? I would say yes in the fact that she was in the room with her husband when he died, so she was pretty close to it, all right? But her experience, she wasn't dying. She was simply in the room with someone she loved who was. Now, Is everybody going to experience that same kind of thing if they put a 
hand in somebody's hand and a hand on somebody's thigh and lay their head on their side? Is everybody going to have that kind of experience? Probably not. Was it actually Ralph passing through her on the way up? I, yeah, you ask God that question, okay, when you get to heaven. But God didn't waste that moment. It provided her peace, comfort, and encouragement. But out of that experience, we do not create a theology or a doctrine and say this is what everybody should have at this particular moment. That's the kind of background thinking we need to have as we evaluate this subject. Now I'm going to move very quickly through seven steps of evaluation, all right? Here's number one. We must remember near death isn't death. Nearly dead is not dead. As Miracle Max told Inigo Montoya in the movie The Princess Bride, any of you remember that movie? Okay. They said, your friend here is mostly dead. But there is a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. With all dead, well, well with all dead, there's usually only one thing left to do. Go through his clothes and look for loose change. <laughs> I want you to understand, the Bible is very clear on this point. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, every person is destined to die. And after that comes the judgment. I can hear some objections already. What about the people in the Bible who died and were brought back to life like Lazarus? Well, consider their experiences in detail maybe a little later. But keep in mind that Lazarus and the others who underwent death twice were rare exceptions. And they were brought back to life for unique reasons. And just remember, those were not near-death experiences. <laughs> those were resurrections. They died and then came back to life. It was a miracle, and miracles like that don't occur every day. If they did, they would be called usuals instead of miracles. The point of Hebrews 9.27 is that for the vast majority of humanity, God's plan is for them to die once and then face eternity. Near-death experiences are just that, near death, not once for all completely dead experiences. Therefore, the stories told by NDERs, okay, NDERs, may tell us nothing more about life after death than someone who has traveled near the city of Dallas, Texas, can tell us about landmarks of the community without ever going there. They could tell us about Thanksgiving Square and Clyde Warren Park or Reunion Tower because they read about it in a book, but they never actually went inside the city limits. Both NDEs, near Dallas experiences and near death experiences, lack certitude. In both cases, reliable maps are available for those planning a journey in an unfamiliar destination, and the only certain map for navigating eternity is the Bible. And that leads us to the second important principle that we highlighted briefly last week. And number two is, the Bible is sufficient on this subject. Books like Heaven is for Real and To Heaven and Back give the impressions that the Bible is insufficient to tell us what we need to know about life after death. Though these books can bring comfort and sometimes hope to those who's lost loved ones, we should be very, very careful about turning away from the Word of God and towards some other source like these experiences in times of grief and sadness. Remember what Alex Malarkey, remember the story last week? All right, Alex Malarkey is one of the one of the boys who wrote a book with his dad about his experience. I, and the great humor is his last name was Malarkey, and 10 years after the book came out, he confessed it was Malarkey, all right? That it wasn't true, that it was a lie. And he said after that, because before the book was written, he had never read the Bible. In the subsequent 10 years, he became a Christian. And it was because of becoming a Christian that he went back and said, all that was a lie. And his his words, the Bible is sufficient on this subject. The Bible is sufficient. And don't forget Paul's words of comfort to those who wanted to know what happened to their loved ones when they died. When Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Write that verse down so you can look it up again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And Paul wrote these words. But we do not want you to be uninformed. One translation says, we don't want you to be ignorant. About those who are dead, asleep, one translation says, but it means dead. 
so that you will not grieve as, because we don't grieve for people who sleep. In fact, quite frankly, I rejoice when they're sleeping. I rejoice when I sleep. But we don't grieve for those as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him those who have fallen asleep or died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of God, that we who are alive and remain, when the Lord comes again, we will not precede, we don't get a head start of those who've already died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, because they're six feet lower, they get to start first. So when they hit the ground, we're all on even space, all right? And you know who the dead in Christ are, right? That's the Presbyterians. They will rise for, that's just a joke from us Baptists, okay? It's just a joke, it's just a joke. Don't take it seriously. Now I completely lost my train of thought. Then, then we who are alive will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We will always be with the Lord. And then the last line, here it is. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are the words that provide comfort because they're based on truth, not experience. Paul is saying to these grieving Thessalonian Christians, God does not want you to be ignorant of what's happened to those that you love who have died. Here is everything you need to know about what happens after the Christian dies. Never in my ministry have I felt the need to turn to a book about near-death experiences to comfort the grieving, to bring hope to the hopeless, or to assure the doubtful. Hundreds and hundreds of times over the decades, I've looked into the faces of family members at memorial services who had just experienced the sting of death and witnessed immediate relief as they heard the reassuring words of God's comfort at this particular time in their life. Number three, we have to be very, very careful that as we read these books and listen to these kinds of experiences, that we don't take that information and add it to the Scripture or take away some Scripture because of what we've heard in that experience. The Bible is very clear that adding to or taking from Scripture is to be condemned. You see, the Bible, it is the eternal, inspired, and infallible Word of God, and because it is, God places an inestimable value on His Word. For those who obey His Word, there are blessings. For those who disobey this, there are curses. The bookend of blessings and curses is easy to spot in the book of Revelation. In the first chapter, verse 3, the book opens with a blessing. Blessed are the ones who read and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and they heed the things which are written in it. Blessed are you. And at the end of that book, in Revelation chapter 22, there's a curse. I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God will take away their part of the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in it. That sounds like pretty serious stuff, doesn't it? The book of Revelation is God's definitive answer to what awaits every person, Christian and non-Christian, after they die. And in this book, God tells us everything he wants us to know. And adding to it or subtracting from it or twisting that truth around, that's serious business and results in some severe consequences. Everyone who writes or preaches about heaven, including yours truly here, we should take this warning very, very seriously. Unfortunately, many of the books and stories about near-death experiences, trips to heaven, coming back to tell the tale, they come uncomfortably close to violating the warning in the book of Revelation. For example, as one book indicated, is the Holy Spirit really bluish in color? Does God the Father whom no one has ever seen, does he really have wings as little four-year-old Colton Burpo claimed? The fourth step of evaluating this process is we should question the identity of any being of light that has ever been seen in these experiences. Not all who've had a near-death experience encountered a being of light, but those who have claimed that, those who have claimed that that being was Jesus Christ. How many, however, many of those reports also claim that Jesus told them things that were contrary to what Jesus said in the Bible. Here's a few examples out of some of those books. One person said that Jesus told them 
Sin isn't a problem. Folks, I got to tell you, I got a problem with that. Because if sin wasn't a problem, then Jesus didn't need to die on a cross. Sin is a problem. Now, in another one of the books, Jesus supposedly told a person, there is no hell. Well, to hell with that. There is one, all right? If there wasn't a hell, what do you really need heaven for? Okay? And, and if, if the Bible isn't right about hell, how can I have any assurance that it's right about heaven? That's why it's so important that we understand what awaits us on the other side. It's why it became, becomes a motivation for us to share with our family and friends. And even, quite frankly, it becomes a motivation to share with people we don't even like the hope of Jesus Christ. I can't imagine anybody that I don't like so bad that I want them to go to hell. I can't imagine that. A another quote from another book says, all people are welcomed into heaven. No, all people are welcome to go to heaven. But only those who believe in Jesus Christ go. Uh, another quote was, every religion is equally true. Certainly, no, that's not true. But how can all this be if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow as Hebrews 13, 8 tells us? All of those statements contradict everything Jesus taught while he was on earth. It's impossible that these indie ears met the real Jesus since he would not contradict his own word. The only conclusion we can draw that is if these people experienced a legitimate near-death experience, the being they encountered was an antichrist, a counterfeit Jesus. Jay Yamamoto anticipates this objection. He is a big proponent of NDEs to such a declaration when he says, how can we conclude that this being of light is an evil spirit when it exudes love, joy, and peace, and when he encourages people to love others? That's a good question. And Yamamoto knew it was, and so he had an answer ready. He said, it's tough to speak against such an argument. It's much easier to speak against a horned demon with a pitchfork who commands people to hate, hurt, and rebel. Spiritual warfare, however, is a battleground where it's often difficult to identify the enemy. Frequently, he disguises himself as a beloved friend. Deception has always been this way, and it's been a deadly weapon in his arsenal, evident since he used it in the Garden of Eden. Indeed, Paul warned Timothy that in later times, some will abandon the faith, follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons in 1 Timothy 4.1. And of course, the most evil deception is when the devil himself appears to be like God. Paul's warning rings true again in 2 Corinthians 11.4 when he says, Satan himself does what? Masquerades as an angel of light. You ever want to read a good book on that subject, but read it in the daylight hours, don't read it after dark, is a book called The Beautiful Side of Evil written by Michaelia, I don't remember. It was written in the 19, late 1970s. Um, I was handed a, um, a, a pre-published copy of the book at the Christian Booksellers Convention. It's when I was working for Fresno Bible House. And um, uh, Harvest House was the publisher of the book. And, and the owner of the company said, Tim, I know you read very fast. He said, we just got a copy. He said, we're going to start selling it tomorrow at the convention. Could you read it tonight and tell me what you think about it? So got back to my room, the hotel room that night, and I thought, okay, I can skim this really quick. Well, I, it, it was a rather enthralling book to read. It was a woman's experience of trying to pursue God. And in her pursuit, a, a, a humble spirit really looking for God, she was moldable in the hands of the evil one because he portrayed himself as an angel of light. And, and it was the night before she was about to become possessed by demonic forces that in an attitude of prayer, Jesus revealed himself to her. And what he told her was, is read the scriptures and the next time this creature shows himself to you as a creature of beauty, ask him, is he... Jesus Christ, God the Son, who gave his life for the humanity of, uh, for, for the world's humanity, for every sin that was committed, and ask him if through him you can be born again. That night, she asked the question in the time of prayer, and that beautiful image that had been appearing to her in her mind turned to evil. The beautiful side of you. And I got to tell you, when I finished reading the book, 
I got up and looked in my closet. I checked the curtains. And I don't scare very easily, but that night, I was a, but, but it reveals to us that, that, that evil can look beautiful. And so we are challenged, all right? We are challenged um, to question the identity of who this is. Number five, beware of the occult. Now, I'm not going to spend much time here, uh, but it's highly probable. But those who have met a being of light during an NDE experience have met not always, but very possibly many have met a demon impersonating Christ trying to lead them in a wrong direction. I'm going to move on to um, number six because these last two are the most important. Number six, Jesus' death and resurrection should be central to any revelation that comes from God. Anything that we experience in life needs to be brought back under the umbrella and the light and the magnifying glass of is this consistent with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some people argued that Saul, who became Paul of Tarsus, had an NDE when he fell to the ground, saw a blinding light at his conversion. Here's how Luke described that event in Acts chapter 9. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Who are you, Lord? I always find that a fascinating question. Who are you, Lord? <laughs> yeah. Who are you, God? Uh, and he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting, but get up, enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Actually, you know what? I've never thought about this before. It's taking my time. Uh, that's okay. I got till 11. <laughs> just, just, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, remember, Saul was a good Jew, he was a teacher. He held, he was really technically had the same classification as a Pharisee. So it makes sense that he believed that this thing that was happening to him came from God because he believed in God. He didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe that Jesus was God. So when he asked the question, ah, I never thought about this before. This is, sorry guys, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Who are you, Lord? He knows he's talking to the God he's always believed in. And then he says, I am Jesus. I am Jesus who is Lord. I am Jesus who is God. I am Jesus who you do not believe in. I am the Messiah that you have rejected. That's good. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up, enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. For in, in the ears, Saul's conversion mirrors a near-death experience, the vision of a bright light, encountering Jesus, the transformation of his life, a, change, uh, a charge of insanity, just as in the ears are sometimes labeled crazy. However, there are a number of problems with this conclusion about Saul. First, he was very much alive and nowhere near death. Second, the light was something unlike a typical NDE experience because it literally blinded Paul until, through a miracle, he later recovered. Third, in telling King Agrippa later about this experience, Paul never mentioned anything remotely resembling a near-death experience. And finally, and most important of all, unlike the Jesus of typical near-death experiences, the Jesus that Paul encountered commissioned him to evangelize exclusively in his name, to bring people to repentance, to humble themselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. There are a few who have an ND experience who come to know Jesus and share it that way, but the vast majority write a book and want money. They write a book, they hold seminars. Paul said, after this moment, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Last of all, the Bible doesn't record any near-death experiences. The real question when evaluating these is, does the Bible talk about them, record them? There are a few people who would say, yes, it does, and they cite examples of Lazarus, Jesus, Stephen, Paul, and John. And we'll look at those briefly in just a moment. Before we do, let me make one point perfectly clear. In the past, God occasionally raised people from the dead. And what I mean by that is they actually were dead. They weren't near death. They were dead. God 
sort of stopped raising people from the dead during the early stages of the New Testament development once the apostles' message became true because now the resurrection of Jesus Christ was what was important, not the raising of Lazarus or others. The test of the proclaimed messenger of God ought to be our dependence upon the Bible, not whether we are able to raise people from the dead or not. Nevertheless, here are some examples of God bringing the dead back to life. In the Old Testament, we have Elijah with the widow of Zarephath's son. We have Elisha, Elisha and the Shunammite woman's son. We have Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones. We have Jesus and Jairus' daughter found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have Jesus and the widow of Nain's son, also in Luke. We have Peter and Tabitha in Acts chapter 9. We have Paul and Eutychus in Acts 20. And we have some unnamed saints in Hebrews chapter 11. Yet we must understand none of these examples qualify as a near-death experience because no individual reported what he or she saw on the other side of death. And that is a requirement to be an NDE. Consider the dramatic story of Lazarus, whom Jesus brought back to life. And how long had he been dead? Four days. How dead was he? He stunk. Not only dead, but decaying now, all right? Nowhere in the biblical record did John give an account of what Lazarus saw, heard, or experienced in heaven. Of course, Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who returned from the dead. All four Gospels agree on this point. Jesus died. He was buried three days later, raised from the dead. But while Jesus hung on the cross, approaching death, he experienced none of the typical near-death experiences. He had no incoherent, out-of-the-body experience. He didn't travel through a tunnel towards light. He didn't have an overwhelming sense of peace. Rather, Jesus was cognizant, rational, forgiving those who condemned him, promising one of the criminals a home in paradise, speaking to his mother and his disciple John, praying to the the Father, surrendering his spirit. After his resurrection from the dead, not the nearly dead, Jesus didn't reveal any information about his experience in heaven. Instead, he prepared his disciples for the mission before them, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God, he said in Acts 1-3. The stoning of Stephen might be the closest thing to a near-death experience recorded in the Bible. Now, uh, in Acts 7, 54 through 56, it says this. When the Jewish officials, the Sanhedrin, heard Stephen's speech condemning them, they were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Some of the elements of this moment of an NDE were present in Stephen's case. An encounter with Jesus, seeing God, witnessing the gates open wide. Nevertheless, there are some key aspects in Stephen's situation that prevent it from being classified a near-death experience. First, Stephen's vision of heaven and Jesus takes place before the stoning. He's not beaten, bruised, or unconscious yet at all. This happens before the stoning began. If Stephen's experience was a true NDE, he would expect the vision to come right before he died. Second of all, the scripture is clear that Stephen received the vision of Jesus in heaven because he was full of the Holy Spirit, meaning God granted him the vision to peer into the heavenly realm. I have rarely heard or read of people who claim NDEs attribute those experiences to the presence of the Spirit of God in them at that moment. Third, Stephen's vision was not unlike the visions given to Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel in the Old Testament, none of whom were near death when they saw the splendor of heaven. Fourth, when Stephen was close to the moment of his death, the writer's focus was not on Stephen's vision, but on the prayer of surrender and forgiveness. In 59 and 60 of that same chapter, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he died. Finally, Stephen actually died instead of nearly died. I can't emphasize strongly enough the Bible does not record people who died or nearly died, took a brief tour of heaven, returned for whatever reason to write a best-selling book about their experiences. 
Didn't the Apostle Paul admit to having a third heaven experience? Yes, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. Some people equate that with a near-death experience, yet two important factors disqualify this as an NDE. First, no indication that Paul was close to death. The apostle confessed that he took this trip to heaven. He said, I don't know if I was in my body or if it was out of my body. I have no idea. Second, Paul did not reveal any details about what he saw in heaven. He was instructed not to talk about it. So here's a question. It's been my question ever since I read the first book on it. If Paul under the inspiration and authority of God, who wrote over half of our New Testament, was told by God, don't talk about what you saw in that third heaven experience, then why is anybody else going to be qualified from a biblical perspective to talk about those things? If Paul couldn't, one of the smartest men ever lived, under the inspiration of God, and he said, don't talk about it. Let me wrap this up. So what does all this mean? Very simply, there are no biblical accounts of this kind of near-death experience that we hear a lot about today. And while I would never say that God is incapable of granting or unwilling to ever grant someone that experience, the weight of Scripture seems to certainly argue against a theological basis or a developing of a doctrine about NDEs. Skeptics claim that near-death experiences are no more real than alien abductions, psychic powers, or poltergeists fodder for charlatans looking to make a quick dollar from the gullible or foolish. To skeptics, indie ears are no better than snake oil salesmen. While we need not to be as cynical as those run-of-the-mill skeptics about NDEs, I think there is good evidence to question anyone claiming to have this experiencing because they need to know that heaven is real. I say to you with all the confidence that I can, We already know that heaven is real because Jesus has promised he's preparing a place for us. That is a promise based on the truth of his own resurrected life, not on an experience. That being said, God will not waste anything. Remember Romans 8, 28? God works all things together for good. So if we will use these seven steps to evaluate our own experience or the experience of somebody else, and we look at it from the purpose of Christ, how he can use that for our benefit, some good will come out of it. But we need to make sure we follow the checklist. Everything we need to know about the thrilling place called heaven is revealed in the Bible. And I hope in a few more sermons down the road, as we pursue this subject, we will discover some more surprising truth about our future home in a place called heaven. Let's pray. Lord, I just talked really, really fast. But your spirit is able to take the bits and pieces that are most important and to help us use those bits and pieces to make decisions about some rather significant things in our lives. The principles we've talked about in evaluating NDE experiences are really the same principles we should use as we evaluate everything in our life. The Bible is sufficient. We should bring everything to the cross, to the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that, Father, we should always use truth to evaluate the validity of our experience and rather never allow our experience as the process we need to validate truth. Father, if there are those who are here today and in spite of the kind of message that it was, if they discover that when they die they want to know that they're going to heaven, I trust they have heard enough to know that going to heaven is, is based not on good works or effort or religious fervor. But Father, it's based on the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus, that we believe He is who He said He was, that because of our sin, our relationship with Him is broken, and that He has done everything necessary to restore our relationship. All He is waiting is for our acknowledgement that we are sinners, He is our Savior, and we invite Him in our life. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.